And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him desire himself and take up his cross and follow me. And whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father with the holy angels. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. All in the Family was a great television show. My dad still jokes that Archie Bunker was his hero. One of the things that made All in the Family so great was the way it made you think while making you laugh at the same time. Gloria did that in one episode when she challenged the rest of the family with a riddle. Maybe you remember the episode. The riddle went like this. A father and son are in a car accident. Unfortunately, the father is killed and the son is seriously injured. When they rush him into the operating room, the doctor says, I can't operate on that boy. He's my son. Gloria then asks the question, if the father was killed in the accident, then what is the relationship between the doctor and the boy? Mike and Archie suggest that the doctor was the boy's stepfather or adopted father or maybe even a priest. All of those answers are wrong, of course. Edith is the one who finally comes up with the right answer. Do you remember what the answer was to the riddle? Give yourself a gold star if you said that the doctor couldn't operate on the boy because the doctor was the boy's mother. Now, I suspect that this riddle was a lot more challenging back in the early 70s because there were far fewer female doctors back then. Something like that, though, happened a little more recently when Drew Faust was installed as Harvard's 28th president. It happened on October 12, 2007. In her first speech as president of the university, she made reference to a letter that had been written back in 1953. The letter was written by James R. Conant, Harvard's 21st president. When he wrote the letter, he left instructions that it was to be given to the first president to be installed and lead Harvard in the new millennium. Drew Faust was amused when she read the letter, and it began with the words, My dear sir. Now, both of these stories deal with a fundamental question that you have to ask yourself and answer at some point in your life. The question is simply this, who am I? That's a question that others will try to answer for you if you let them. Just look at Archie. His attitude was, you're a woman, you couldn't possibly be a doctor. Look at James R. Conant. His attitude was, you're a woman, you couldn't possibly be the president of Harvard University. Who am I? People will answer that question for you if you let them. Who am I? Wall Street and Madison Avenue will tell you that you're a consumer who needs to spend a lot of money to buy our products and be a part of the in crowd. 
Who am I? You're an immigrant, which means you must be living off of welfare and breaking our laws. Who am I? You're a liberal Democrat, which means that you must be a fan of people who kill unborn babies. Or you're a conservative Republican, which means you must be an intolerant bigot. Who am I? You're an elderly person, which means that you couldn't possibly be capable of making decisions for yourself. Who am I? Jesus knew what it was like to have people tell you who you are and who you're supposed to be. It happened to him all the time. The Pharisees said that he was a troublemaker who needed to be eliminated. The people in the crowds saw him as a Santa Claus who was there to do nice things for them. The Romans said he was a religious nut, but harmless. Even his mother and brothers thought that he'd lost his marbles. That's why they went and tried to bring him home. Jesus was preaching in a crowded house at the time, and you can almost picture his family standing outside pleading with him, Jesus, come home with us before you get yourself into all kinds of trouble. Forget about all of this nonsense about being the Son of God. That's not who you are, Jesus. You're supposed to be a carpenter. Usually Jesus ignored things like this. But when Peter tried to tell him who he was and who he was supposed to be, Peter gave him a, Jesus gave him a good tongue lashing. Let's go back and, and look at their confrontation. It starts when Jesus tells the disciples for the first time that he is going to be arrested and crucified. When Peter hears that, He becomes indignant and says, God forbid, this will never happen to you, Lord. In other words, you're not going to be that kind of a Messiah if I have anything to say about it. Jesus wasn't about to let Peter define him, or anyone else for that matter. So when Peter says that, Jesus stares him down and says, get behind me, Satan, For you are setting your mind not on the things of God, but on the things of man. In other words, that's not who I am, Peter. I'm not going to be a grand and glorious Messiah. I'm going to be a suffering servant. So I'm going to be a Messiah who lays down his life and goes to the cross, whether you like it or not. Jesus would simply tell you this. Don't let others tell you who you are or who you're supposed to be. Warren Buffett, the billionaire, would agree with Jesus. Several years ago, in the annual report that he sends to his investors, he shared a wonderful story about a woman named Rose Blumpkin. She lives in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, Rose Blumpkin started the Nebraska Furniture March many years ago when she emigrated to this country from Russia. At 94 years of age, she was still working every day in the store's carpet department. In his annual report, Buffett wrote that she was clearly gathering speed and, quote, would probably reach full potential in five or ten years. Therefore, he said, I have convinced the board to scrap our mandatory retirement at 100 policy, and it's about time. He said, managers, good managers are too scarce. I can't afford to lose one just because they've added another year to their age. Who am I? Don't let others answer that question for you. After Jesus answered that question for himself, He offered some words of wisdom that can help you answer that question for yourself. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. 
Now that, my friends, is the definition of a disciple. Who am I? The best answer to that question is to say, I am a disciple of the risen Christ. When you say that, everything else will fall into place because that's what makes it possible for you to be the person God created you to be. Who am I? I am a disciple of the risen Christ. I follow Jesus. So I'm a mother which means that I'm going to teach my children right from wrong, even if they say they hate me from time to time. I follow Jesus, and I'm a worker. So I'm never going to let my job and the pursuit of material things become more important than my family. I follow Jesus, which means I'm a person of integrity, So when I see someone being used or abused, I'm going to say something, even if it makes me unpopular with people who I thought were my friends. When you define yourself as a disciple of the risen Christ, it doesn't mean your life is going to be easier, but it will mean that your life will be better. René Lacroix Bondé would agree with that. Back in 1988... She was a music teacher at San Clemente High School. She was also getting ready for her wedding. In March of that year, she and her students were preparing for a big music competition. When she chose a piece by Brahms for the competition, her students complained. They said it was boring. Renee told them, however, that if they put their trust in her, they would make beautiful music. Well, they won the competition. A month later, Renee fell while getting into bed. When she woke up in the hospital, her doctor said, Renee, your neck is broken. You're paralyzed from the neck down. Renee writes, I tried to grasp the impact of the injury on my life, or what used to be my life. It was clear my plans were all shattered as my vertebrae. I couldn't teach, I couldn't sing, and certainly I couldn't expect Don to marry a quadriplegic when he had proposed to a healthy woman. She then asked that question that most of us would probably ask in a situation like that. Why? Why, God? It was then that she heard that still, small voice say the same thing to her that she had said to her students a month early. You may not always get to choose the song, but if you put your trust in me, you will surely make beautiful music. Renee asked herself, can I show the same kind of faith to God that I asked my students to have in me. She then answered that question and said, Yes, Lord, I will trust you. The first song he gave me was incredibly precious. My beloved Dawn insisted on becoming my husband. It's been nine years since then, and God has been good. The teaching I've done hasn't been at school, but at church where I've been able to form three youth choirs. I've made a recording of songs for people who need courage, strength, and hope, like I did. I've been able to give concerts where I sing and tell my story to prisoners, teenagers, church, and women's groups. No, my life is not all what I'd planned, but every now and then I see the sweet harmonies and sweeping arpeggios of God all around me. And I think, now this is music. Who am I? I'm not going to let others tell me who I am or who I am supposed to be. I am a disciple of the risen Christ. I follow Jesus. It doesn't mean that my life will be easier, but it does mean that my life will be better. Amen.